Hi guys, today's video is from my membership called the Glow Quick Kitchen Cooking Circle and in the membership I focus on teaching all about seasonal and intuitive cooking so cooking without having to necessarily rely on recipes and really cooking in tune with the seasons and just really having a ton of fun in the kitchen without stressing and being able to rely on your instincts and cravings when you're cooking. So every month in the membership I post a new video cooking class like the one that you're about to see now. I also post at least three new recipes every month and a newsletter. So I hope you enjoy this video and I'll put a link for the cooking circle below. <music> Hello guys welcome back it's Masha happy February we're getting a little closer to spring which I'm very excited about today we'll be talking about finding and honing in on your basics and building blocks in the kitchen knowing how to prepare a few very basic things and having them on hand can make mealtime so much more joyful and much more of a breeze these aren't really recipes but more of a starting point they're building blocks that will then make up or fill out your meals. They can be things like a pot of beans or grains, roasted vegetables or baked potatoes or sweet potatoes, a really good sauce, prepared greens, quick pickles, etc. These are things that you won't need a rigid recipe for, or if you do, it's very easy to memorize and modify according to the ingredients that you have on hand or your cravings. I call this kind of cooking component cooking, and this is usually the closest that I come to meal prep because it allows for so much more flexibility and creativity. How this works is instead of having very rigid meals planned or prepared for the week, you can freely put together dishes using different components based on your cravings. And I'm a big believer that listening to and supporting your cravings with wholesome whole foods is really the best way to go. So in these classes, we're slowly chipping away at my favorite mealtime formula, which is a well-stocked pantry, which we covered in last month's class, plus a few of these back pocket basics that we'll be covering in this class, plus all the fun, fresh, seasonal goodies. When all of these components are brought together, it's really fun and joyful and much easier to put together a really good meal. This is the way that I prefer to cook most of the time. Today I'll show you how to prep some of my favorite basics and how I then put them together into really delicious colorful meals. But the true goal here is to find your favorite building blocks, to evolve them, and make them the perfect fit for you. So my first essential and very favorite building block in the kitchen is legumes. So beans and lentils. Beans are amazing. They're total superfoods and unlike other marketed superfoods, they are extremely affordable. Pretty much every blue zone in the world consumes a lot of beans and blue zones are the areas in the world that have the highest life expectancy. And besides that, beans are just really delicious and super, super versatile. So my go-to way to cook beans and lentils is to cook them from scratch, so from dry. I do buy canned beans and they're extremely convenient, but they still definitely don't compare to a really good pot of home-cooked beans. Dry beans are even more affordable than canned beans. They can be bought in bulk, which sometimes helps avoid extra unnecessary plastic and packaging. And when you cook beans at home from scratch, you can flavor them a million different ways, which just makes for the most delicious beans. So I already have a pot of chickpeas cooking on the stovetop. I got them started because they can take a while, so I didn't want to wait around for them while do doing this class. And today I chose to cook chickpeas, but this method can be applied to pretty much any beans and lentils. Lentils just take much quicker to cook, but they're pretty much the same. And this is how I cook beans every time. First, I soak the beans overnight. Soaking the beans helps them cook quicker and it helps them cook through much more evenly, which results in beautiful creamy beans. Soaking also makes beans more digestible. It helps rid them of phytic acid, which for some people causes digestive discomfort. I usually start out with one or two cups of beans. I like to make a lot because I then use them throughout the week and it's super convenient. I put the beans in a bowl and cover them with plenty of water. You wanna cover the beans with plenty of water because they're gonna absorb a bunch of that water 
and you don't want them to run out of water while they're soaking overnight. So I usually soak overnight. You can soak beans for up to 24 hours. After that, a crucial step is to rinse them really well. So drain all of that soaking water and rinse them. Then place the beans in a large pot and cover them with plenty of water again. And beans make really, really delicious broth. So it just makes sense to cover them with a lot of water, which will turn into broth. It doesn't matter how much. I usually cover it by, I don't know, maybe like three fingers width. It really depends on how much broth you want to have, but remember that they're going to absorb more of that water while they're cooking and some of the water is going to cook off. So it really doesn't hurt to add a lot of water. Then I salt the beans. I salt them with plenty of salt. There are a lot of opinions around about salting beans. Some say that salting beans in the beginning of cooking can make them really tough and can make them uh, never cook through. I find that's totally not true, especially for soaked beans. And I find that salting them at the very beginning of the cooking process is crucial because that way they become properly seasoned and absorb the salt while they're cooking. Whereas if you were to salt them at the end of the cooking time, um, it would just be a very surface level salting, like you would salt the broth and maybe a little bit of the outside of the beans, but they wouldn't be as beautifully seasoned all the way through as beans that you salt at the very beginning. And you can stop here and cook the beans in really well salted water, and that's totally fine. Or you can go a step further and add aromatics. And aromatics are gonna flavor the beans. They're also gonna flavor the broth. And like I said earlier, the broth that beans make is delicious, especially if they're cooked with aromatics. And you can then go on to eat that broth. You can use it as vegetable broth. So I'll usually eat some of it and I'll freeze some of it for future use. And that way you don't really ever need to buy vegetable broth. For my aromatics today, I added a strip of combo seaweed. Combo seaweed doesn't necessarily make the broth taste like seaweed or fishy or anything like that. It just gives it a very, very subtle savoriness. And the other really cool thing about combo seaweed is that it helps make the beans even more digestible. So if you have digestive trouble from beans, um, taking these two steps, soaking them, rinsing them really well, and adding kombu should definitely help you tolerate them better. And also the more you eat beans, the more your digestive flora gets used to them and adapts to them, and the less digestive trouble you have generally. Along with the kombu, I added some whole black peppercorns, some bay leaf, an onion, and I already had a half of a red onion in the fridge, and this is a great time to use up any flavorful veggie scraps that you have. Like I have an onion, some unused garlic, leek tops, carrot peelings, anything like that. And I also added a few cloves of garlic and then brought it all to a simmer. And again, you can play around with the aromatics here. Different beans do really well with different aromatics. For example, if I'm cooking white beans, I love them with sage. If I'm cooking black beans, I really like adding something spicy like chipotle powder or whole dried chilies are really good in there. And I'll write some of my favorite bean and aromatic combinations down below. And once the beans are simmering, there's really no set time for how long they're gonna cook. This depends on how long you soaked your beans, how old your beans are, the kind of beans that you're using. It usually takes anywhere from 40 minutes to up to two hours. I personally like to go on a really gentle simmer and simmer the beans for a pretty long time. And that way the gentle simmer cooks them really tenderly and they come out really uh, creamy and evenly cooked and not cracked. But basically just keep tasting your beans for creaminess and just cook until they're delicious and nicely cooked through. So these guys are done. These I cooked for about two hours, but that's again because I had them on a super, super low and slow simmer. You could definitely cook them quicker if you up the simmer a little bit. Also depends on how old the chickpeas are. So what I do is I set my strainer over a bowl. I take my tongs and I discard the aromatics into the strainer. So for example, this was the kombu seaweed, the bay leaves, the red onion. And then I just push down on the aromatics to really drain them of any liquid and then I compost them and I pour any of the broth back in. And then my absolute favorite way to enjoy freshly cooked brothy beans like this is literally served in a bowl with their broth. They're so good like this. And then I'll literally have the beans just like this 
maybe with a little crack of fresh black pepper. I also like adding a little bit of fresh herbs on top. I happen to have some salsa verde that I made a few days ago, so I'm gonna add some. And by the way, the recipe for salsa verde is in the cooking circle. It's in class number two. One of my favorite sauces, it's an herb sauce, so delicious. This is such a treat for when you make some freshly cooked beans. To fill this meal out, you could have it with some toast. You can add a scoop of cooked rice or cooked quinoa. You can add chili flakes on top. You can add um, the roasted vegetables in there. The, the possibilities are endless. And I'll demonstrate a few other ways to use these beans a little bit later in the class. The next staple component that I make all the time is roasted vegetables, but specifically roasted potatoes. The great thing about potatoes, whether sweet potatoes or regular potatoes, is that they can be roasted whole. So you don't have to peel them, you don't have to chop them, you can do it really, really quickly. All you have to do is throw them in the oven and that's probably one of the reasons that it's one of my go-tos because it's so easy. So I have two Japanese sweet potatoes that I already baked here. I love all kinds of sweet potatoes, but the Japanese ones have like a purplish skin and the flesh on the inside is white or yellow and these ones are particularly sweet to me they taste like cake they're just so delicious and they become really caramelized when roasted and to cook them all i did was i preheated the oven to 400 um, f 200 c i pricked the potatoes with a fork several times which just helps them cook through um, quicker. I put them on a parchment covered baking sheet and I baked them for about an hour. The cooking time depends on um, the size of your potatoes and what kind of potatoes you're using. So just watch them when they're done, they should just feel really soft. So that's that and I'll show you an example of how I put them into a meal a little later. Another one of my favorite basics is grains. So if you have a pot of cooked grains and a pot of beans in the fridge, you're pretty much golden. You can make so many meals out of that. And today I'll just show you two of my favorite ways to prepare two different grains, um, rice and quinoa. So first I'll do the rice and this is gonna be coconut rice and coconut rice, if you've never had it, is like the most decadent rice that you can ever imagine. The fattiness from the coconut milk together with the starchy, fragrant rice is so, so good. So today I'm using white rice and I really prefer white rice to brown rice. It cooks quicker, I like the texture more, I like the flavor more. You can totally use brown rice. The wet to dry ratios would just be a little bit different and the cooking time would be longer. I add some rice to a pot along with some water a can of coconut milk and i prefer using full fat coconut milk for pretty much everything you could use light coconut milk here as well i add some salt to taste to season the rice then cover it bring it over to the stove and bring it up to a boil. Then once the rice boils, lower the heat to a simmer and let it simmer covered for 15 minutes. Then turn off the heat, take off the lid, place a towel over the pot, then place the lid back on and let the rice steam for another 10 to 15 minutes. And then you have this beautiful, delicious coconut rice. Another grain that I love and that I'll show you how I cook today is quinoa. Quinoa is delicious, it's really filling, it's protein rich, and it cooks super, super quickly. So with quinoa, I always rinse it before cooking it because it does have a very bitter coating that can leave the final product tasting really bitter and not very good. By the way, you can also rinse rice like this. And what that's supposed to do is make the rice fluffier in the end because it rids it of any excess starches. I usually skip the step just out of sheer laziness, but if you want extra, extra fluffy rice, that's definitely a great thing to do. And this is just a simple way that I like to flavor quinoa. I first saute a shallot and some garlic in the pot that I'll be cooking the quinoa and this just makes it a little more flavorful. I like shallot here, not onion, because it cooks much quicker than onion. So this is kind of a big shallot. I'm just gonna do half of it. You can slice the shallot. I like dicing it finely, just so it kind of blends in with the quinoa. So I dice it. And then I do one clove of garlic. Smash it, peel it. I take the little sprout out of the garlic. So I get my garlic at the farmer's market and at this point it was harvested a really long time ago. 
and that's why it has this huge sprout. And taking out the sprout is supposed to make the garlic easier to digest. I don't always do it, but I do it when the sprout is huge like it is in here. And I just mince. And while I'm mincing the garlic, I'm just gonna preheat my pot to medium heat. I'm gonna add some olive oil to the bottom of my pot. You can use other oil like avocado oil. And I'm gonna add the garlic and shallot to the pot. And I'm gonna cook these um, for just about like five minutes just to give them a head start and until the shallot is translucent. You could totally start rice or really any grains the same way. So even for the coconut rice, you can start it the same way by sauteing some shallot and garlic, even ginger would be good in there with coconut. And then just follow the coconut rice recipe and that will just make your rice even more savory. Okay, so it's been four or five minutes and the shallot is looking nice and translucent. So I'm gonna add the rinsed quinoa and some water, salt to taste to season the quinoa, mixing all this. And this is the same principle as with the rice. We're just gonna bring this to a boil, then lower the heat to a simmer, simmer for 15 minutes, then put the towel over and steam for another 10 or 15 minutes. And then we've got nice fluffy quinoa. My next total staple basic essential building block is greens. I love greens. I pretty much can't live without them. They make me feel so good. I think they taste amazing. They're so versatile. Usually when I go to the farmer's market or to the store, I look to buy two different types of greens. Um, I usually buy greens to eat raw in salads, so lettuces and things like that, more tender greens. And then I also look for greens to cook and to wilt into soups and things like that. And that's usually more sturdy greens like chard that I have here or kale or collard greens, mustard greens. And a really easy and quick way that I like to prep more sturdy greens just to have in the fridge and to add to all kinds of meals is to blanch them. So right now I have a pot of really well salted water set to a boil. This is my beautiful chard from the farmer's market. It's kind of a small bunch for this preparation. I wish I got two, but We'll just make it work. So the way that I'm gonna prep this is I'm gonna stem the chard and um, add the greens to a colander to then later wash. And with chard, I love um, chard stems. I love their taste. And I'm gonna save them and use them in something, maybe like a soup, or I might juice them for my green juice. I've got my chard greens. I'm gonna take them over to the sink and rinse them. Now I'm gonna take the rinsed greens to my boiling water and add them in and we're just gonna quickly blanch them for about one minute I would say until they're bright green and tender looking and the cooking time might vary depending on the kind of greens that you're using so collard greens or something tougher than chard might take longer it might take about two minutes just watch it and go by feel so about a minute in and the greens are looking good so I'm gonna drain them. I'm gonna quickly rinse them with cold water just to make them easier to handle. And then I'm gonna bring the colander over a bowl like this. You see the amount is kind of small. That's why I was saying that I should have gotten two or three bunches because the greens shrink down in size so much. But basically now that they're cool enough to handle because we rinsed them in cold water, I'm just gonna gently squeeze out all the water because they take on a lot of water. And in the process, you're basically making like a ball, a ball of greens like this. And it looks small, but you know that there's a whole bunch of chard in there. And then once you get all the water or most of the water out of there, just store the greens in a Tupperware or some kind of airtight container. You can even put them in a jar. And when you're ready to use them, just slice off little ribbons and add them to whatever dish that you're cooking. And I'll show you all of this a little bit later when we put everything together. And then a quick note on more tender greens that you're gonna eat raw. Don't underestimate prepping raw greens like this by just washing them, drying them, cutting them, and having them all ready to go. 
it's such a game changer even though it seems like such a small thing so that when the time comes to eat a salad or to add some raw greens to a meal you won't be deterred by the need to wash them and dry them and slice them in the business of life so this is just a bunch of romaine lettuce and what i would do with it is i would separate it into leaves i'm gonna give the leaves a quick rinse shake them off and then here if you have a salad spinner definitely use that it's the perfect tool for the job i don't have one mine broke a little while ago and i'm kind of just toying with the idea of not replacing it just because i don't really love having like single use appliances and tools in the kitchen and um, this is a really great method that works to dry greens um, is just to layer a few towels put the greens on them kind of a single layer and then just roll the greens in the towel so i'm just gonna dry these guys out gonna unroll them just pat dry whatever areas look like they didn't dry out and then to take the convenience even a step further i'm just gonna slice them up so i usually with romaine i do a few cuts lengthwise and then just slice into more bite-sized pieces and then i'm gonna take my tupperware transfer all the greens in here and that's it the salad is so easy to make when you have greens like this and that way you don't have to buy those plastic clamshells of greens which i do buy sometimes but i try to avoid because of that packaging my next basic staple essential is cruciferous vegetables. Uh, cruciferous vegetables are total nutritional powerhouses. They're sulfur rich, so good for you. Also really delicious. So um, today I'll be preparing broccoli and cauliflower. For the half of these, I'm gonna roast and the rest I'm gonna chop finely and leave raw, which will make it really easy to add cruciferous vegetables to stir fries and soups and all kinds of things throughout the week. So I have the oven preheating to 400 Fahrenheit. I'm lining a baking sheet with parchment paper and I'm just gonna cut half of this broccoli into florets and transfer them to the baking sheet. So cauliflower and broccoli have a sort of similar cooking time and that's why I'm roasting them together. Cauliflower does tend to need longer, but I don't mind and I actually prefer the broccoli to be a little charred. I think it's delicious that way. So while the cauliflower finishes cooking, the broccoli will get a little charred and I really don't mind. But if you don't like that, you could, instead of mixing the cauliflower and broccoli on the baking sheet, you could have the cauliflower off to one side and the broccoli off to the other side. And that way you can remove the broccoli from the baking sheet earlier than the cauliflower. Now I'm gonna cut half of the cauliflower into florets. I'm gonna drizzle the veggies with some oil, season them with salt, black pepper, gonna mix them to coat. And this is off to roast for, I'm guessing, 35 to 40 minutes. And then with the rest of our cauliflower and broccoli, I'm just gonna really finely chop it and then just store it raw in a jar or a Tupperware. And that just makes it really easy to add these vegetables to so many dishes, like I said earlier, to stir fries or soups or stews, things like that. And chopping them finely makes them cook much quicker, which is ideal for like a quick meal or stir fry situation. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the cauliflower. So I transferred the chopped veggies to jars and here we are and we'll use this in our final products. Next is sauce and a good sauce really has the ability to pull a meal together. So let's say you have grains and beans and other seasonal veggies that you already prepped in the fridge but how do you pull them all together into something that makes sense and tastes delicious and the answer is sauce so i have a lot of different go-to sauces for different situations but probably my most universal one is a tahini sauce um, i love tahini tahini is basically a sesame seed butter if you don't know 
It's creamy, it's fatty, it's a little bit bitter, it's really delicious. I use this brand, it's local. So I usually pull together a sauce like this without a recipe. It has about three key ingredients, tahini, lemon juice, and some miso, as well as some seasoning, salt and pepper and stuff like that. And I usually eyeball it, but I'll try to measure. So I'm gonna do about, let's say two tablespoons of tahini. I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of miso. Uh, miso is just so delicious. It's savory, it's umami, it has a little bit of sweetness. I'm adding about a tablespoon. And the one that I use is white miso. It's kind of mellow tasting, not too intense, even though I do like intense ones too. But for this purpose, a nice mellow white miso is great. And then I'm gonna juice a lemon. And another awesome thing about tahini sauces is that they don't really need oil because tahini is plenty fatty on its own. So I'm gonna add in the lemon juice and I'm gonna work in the miso and tahini. I'm gonna add a little pinch of salt, some black pepper, also a little splash of maple syrup just to balance out the bitterness of the tahini and the acidity of the lemon. And then to thin out the sauce to a more thin saucy consistency and to make it even more creamy, I'm gonna add little splashes of ice water. And ice water, because there's some reaction in the really cold water and tahini that happens that makes it really, really creamy. I don't remember the actual reason for it, but it's something like that. Like if you ever make hummus at home with tahini and chickpeas and olive oil, adding a little bit of ice water at the end makes it extra creamy. So I'm just gonna add a splash, mix it in. Okay, this looks perfect to me. The ice water makes it nice and glossy and it tastes delicious. Lemony, bright, creamy. And the next and last thing that I'll show today before we pull everything together into more cohesive meals is quick pickled red onion. So I have a small red onion here. I'm gonna take off the skin. And you can quick pickle so many things, pretty much any veggies. You can do radish, you can do cabbage, jalapenos, you name it, you can probably quick pickle it. I love doing onion because it's sharp. Red onion in particular becomes this really beautiful pink color when it's quick pickled and it's so nice to finish pretty much any meal with it because it gives you a little bit of brightness and sharpness and acidity, but it also adds this electric pink color to any meal and makes everything look fancy. I'm gonna have the onion through the root end and I'm just gonna thinly slice it. You can also do this on a mandolin slicer. I'm gonna transfer the sliced onion to a clean glass jar and then i usually use a one to two ratio of vinegar to water so one part vinegar two parts water so let's do about a quarter cup vinegar i'm using apple cider vinegar you can also use white vinegar um, i sometimes use rice vinegar so i used a quarter cup of vinegar which means that i need half a cup of water and I usually add warm water just because we're gonna add salt and sugar as well and we want the salt and sugar to dissolve. I'm adding more both water and vinegar just to submerge the onion because that amount wasn't enough. But as long as you remember that one to two ratio, you're good. And then for one onion, I usually add about one and a half teaspoons of salt and about one teaspoon of sugar. And I'm using coconut sugar just because that's my preferred favorite sugar, but you can use any kind of sugar. And then you can also add all kinds of aromatics like bay leaf, rosemary sprigs, thyme sprigs, peppercorns. I'm just gonna leave them simple today and close the jar, then shake to get everything incorporated and to get the salt and sugar to dissolve and then you can let this sit out for about an hour and then refrigerate and you have these instant quick pickles and now i'll just show you a few examples of how i would pull all of these components and basics together into some really delicious meals so let's start with the sweet potato that we roasted so i have it here i'm gonna slice it in half uh, crosswise 
and maybe cut off these crispy parts on the ends. And then I'm going to slice those pieces in half lengthwise like this so that we have some exposed flesh. And one of my favorite things to do with roasted sweet potatoes like these is to sear them. And searing the sweet potatoes gives them kind of like a twice baked potato texture because they because they obviously still stay soft on the inside, but then the seared parts get nice and crispy and it's really delicious. So I'm going to preheat my pan here over medium heat. I'm going to add some oil to the hot pan. And I also really like flavoring the oil for searing the sweet potatoes with something nice and savory. And today I'm going to do that with some smoked paprika, which will contrast really well with the sweet potatoes. I like a dash to taste. Can I get that incorporated? And then once that looks nice and incorporated, I'm going to take the sweet potatoes and place them face down into the oil. And we're just gonna let them sear until the undersides get nice and crispy. And then once the undersides of the potatoes look nice and golden, it's time to serve. I'm gonna nestle the sweet potatoes into a bowl. And I'm gonna save some of that paprika oil for finishing. On top, I'm gonna add some of those chickpeas that I cooked without the broth. So I'm just gonna spoon them over. You could also sear the chickpeas in the paprika oil to make them nice and crispy. Now we're gonna bring out our ball of blanched greens and, and slice off some of them into thin little ribbons and then add them to the bowl and remember that they'll expand a lot because a lot of greens in there. We'll top it with our tahini sauce and also to finish it off some of the quick pickled red onions and here we go a beautiful bowl that came together super quickly and here's an example of another bowl type meal that i'm gonna make with the raw greens that we prepped so i'm just gonna do a nice handful of the greens in here some of the quinoa And we'll do some of our roasted cruciferous veg. Some of those chickpeas. Plenty of our tahini sauce. Especially to dress those raw greens. And more of the quick pickled onions. And there you have it. Another beautiful bowl possibility. Next up, we're gonna throw together some coconut fried rice with those chopped cruciferous veggies that we made. I'm preheating a large skillet over medium-high heat. I'm gonna add some oil as usual. And then once the oil is warm, I'm adding shallot, garlic, and some ginger. And these are all flavors that go really well with coconut since our rice is a coconut rice. I'm going to add a little pinch of salt and saute these veggies for about five minutes. And then once the shallot is nice and translucent, I'm going to add a bunch of our cruciferous veggies that we chopped. Another pinch of salt. And I'm going to saute these until they're fully cooked which shouldn't take a very long time because they're so finely chopped. Okay, so our veggies are nice and soft. And now I'm gonna add some of our coconut rice. And I'm just gonna cook it for another five or so minutes just to get it heated through and incorporated and a little bit crispy. And then at the end, just to season everything a little bit more and, and bring all the flavors together, I'm gonna add some tamari, which is a gluten-free soy sauce. And this is just gonna bring a little more depth of flavor and uh, saltiness to the whole thing. Just a little bit to taste. I'm also gonna add some sesame oil, which is just gonna go really well with all these flavors like the coconut and ginger and um, garlic and shallot. And again, just a little bit because sesame oil is very potent and strong and just mix everything through so that all the flavors get incorporated. So I'm just gonna plate this rice and this can be um, seen as a side dish. It can also be main, especially if you serve it with maybe some tofu 
or tempeh or again beans or something like that and I'm gonna top it with some cilantro so I'm doing cilantro but green onion would also be really good here there we are And the very last recipe that I'm going to show you guys is a minestrone soup. So minestrone is an Italian soup that doesn't have a set recipe because it's usually made out of odds and ends. It often has lots of vegetables, beans, sometimes has pasta in it. So we're going to pull all of our little odds and ends together and make a really delicious soup. And sorry about the sun, I usually don't film at this time, but it's getting late in the day so it's really bright um, so i'm preheating my soup pot over medium heat i'm gonna add olive oil to coat the bottom of the pot and i'm gonna add some onion and celery and basically you want to start a minestrone with a mirepoix or a sofrito or some combination of those vegetables so i'm using onion and celery today because that's what i have on hand um, a classic combination would be onion, celery, and carrot, or onion and carrot, or onion and celery like I'm doing. I'm gonna add a pinch of salt. It could be just an onion. In place of the onion, it could be a leek. As long as you're building some sort of flavor base with specifically alliums like onion or leek and garlic. The garlic will add a little later. So I'm gonna saute these veggies until they're soft and translucent but not browned and i love making this kind of soup especially towards the end of the week that's usually when i have a bunch of odds and ends in the fridge from cooking all week it's a great clean out the fridge dish because everything can basically be thrown into the pot and it always comes out delicious it's nourishing it's packed with veggies so today what i'm going to use in there besides the onion and celery that we started with is some butternut squash i happen to have like a half of a large butternut squash that I peeled and cubed and it's gonna be really good in there. I'm gonna add our chickpeas and any kind of beans are good in this soup. White beans are delicious. Um, cranberry beans uh, are really good. I wouldn't add black beans because that would take it to more like a chili territory but any lighter colored beans are delicious and the great thing about having these beans is that we already have broth and we're gonna use this bean broth in the soup and it's gonna make the soup even more deeply flavored i'm also gonna add some of our chopped cruciferous veggies in there okay doc so our veggies are looking good and soft and translucent i'm gonna add some garlic some chili flakes mixing everything in just until the garlic is fragrant which takes about 30 seconds. Okay, next I'm gonna add the butternut squash, our chopped cruciferous veggies, and the chickpeas together with their broth. So right now there is not enough broth in here. For this kind of soup, you just add the broth or the liquid by feel. Just stop when the soup is at the consistency that you would like it to be. So I have another jar of the chickpeas and I'm just gonna strain out the broth into here. And if you ever don't have enough broth, you can totally use water, just salt it more since water is not as salty as broth. So yeah, I'm gonna actually need to add a little water to supplement. I'm gonna add plenty of salt just to season everything some black pepper i like both chili flakes and black pepper i think they bring different things to the table so this is looking really beautiful and colorful i'm gonna cover the pot and bring this to a simmer and then i'll let the soup simmer until the butternut squash and the cauliflower and broccoli are fully cooked through um, i'm guessing it's gonna take around 25 to 30 minutes and if you're adding different vegetables in here, just keep checking them for doneness. I always check the slowest cooking vegetable first because if that's cooked, then the rest of the veggies are definitely cooked. Once the soup is done cooking, I'm gonna add the rest of our blanched chard in here. And since that's already blanched, I don't need to cook it. So I'm gonna add it in at the very last minute. And once the soup is done and the heat is off, I'm also going to add a juice of one lemon and that just helps brighten everything up and awaken all the flavors and it's done. I love minestrone, it's such a great concept, I don't know when you want to call it a recipe. It's delicious with some garlic bread or it could be served 
as a first course with some sort of second course. I hope this little demo was helpful for you to see how many delicious elaborate meals can be made out of very simple staples. I encourage you to find your own basics and building blocks that you love, to memorize those recipes and to always have them in your back pocket to lean on. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next month.